Thank you. I'm with the U.S. Geological Survey, um, Columbia Environmental Research Center in Columbia, Missouri. So I came, came in for this. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about our research center at the beginning of this talk before I get into the, the bottom of the river and uh, what's going on down there. So we're a USGS, we're a federal um, research group. I'm, I'm located in a river studies branch. Um, it was established in 2001. It's an interdisciplinary research group. We work primarily on the Missouri River, large river tributaries. We have uh, some research going on in Ozark streams. Our um, sort of strengths are in geomorphology and habitat dynamics. That's where I come from. We work on endangered pallid sturgeon life history. We have a uh, pretty active research program working on invasive Asian carp. And so the, the endangered fish, we're interested in keeping them. The Asian carp, we're interested in figuring out how to get rid of them. Um, we have some folks working on mussel habitats, primarily in the Ozarks, and then we have um, some bio-criteria work in benthic invertebrates, actually some cooperators here in Kansas City. Um, my specific group, the geomorphic and habitat group, um, we do hydroacoustics and surveying, and if you don't know what that is, that's what a lot of this talk will be about. So we use tools to look at, at problems that are mostly related to fish habitat issues um, on, to look at the bottom of the river. We do modeling, we do a lot of um, GIS remote sensing, mapping, and computer programming, and we're currently working on the Missouri River, large tributaries, Ozarks, and all over the Great Plains as well, um, looking at some remote sensing and bird habitat. All of the science in the, U in the U.S. Geological Survey, are, our research is mostly aimed at informing management decisions and helping Department of Interior partner agencies. With the case of the pallid sturgeon, that's looking at um, working with the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Army Corps of Engineers at um, endangered species life history issues on the Missouri River. So diving down into the talk, who has been out on the Missouri River? Almost all of you, that's great. So uh, do some of you kayak on the Missouri River and have you noticed the, the boils, the big round structures that recirculate and sometimes like the first time I was out on the Missouri, I'd, I'd worked on rivers out west and I was out on the Missouri and I thought it was gonna take my boat down. So these large boils are actually the surface, they're, they're a sign on the surface of what's below. So in cross section in rivers, you have um, a long, longitudinal section, so this is the bottom of the river, and you have sand dunes. And associated with, as the flow goes over the sand dunes, you have different, different um, flow circulation patterns. So this is sort of a simple cross section things actually get a lot more complex. So this is a three-dimensional um, large eddy simulation model, really complex modeling. People spend their entire careers doing this. And this is the flow coming off of one of those dunes going to the surface. And when it hits the surface, we'll go through it again, that red mark right there, that's a boil. So the boils are these structures that are, that are turbulent structures coming off the edge of the dunes, moving through the water column and showing up at the surface. So the boils are actually moving with the river and they're moving as dunes move. So they're, they're fascinating because that's sort of a surface clue of what's going on down there. So measuring large rivers is really different than measuring small rivers. Um, for, first of all, the Missouri River is extremely challenging because it's, what color is it? <laughs> it's muddy, it's brown, and, and next month you'll find out more about that, but it's, it's got a heavy sediment load, much less than it did pre-channelization um, and before the large dams went in. But um, it's pretty brown and it's very large. So in, in measuring rivers, a lot of what we, we traditionally have done is surveying with a, with a stick. It used to be a survey rod, now we use GPS. Well, on a river like the Missouri, that's gonna take you a really long time. And in fact, there are a lot of challenges. Um, I lost a boot in that picture right there. The, the mud on the river can be um, really, it can trap you and on the shore, you can run into obstacles like trees. So we, we decided a lot, or we learned a long time ago that to truly survey the river, we're gonna need to get, get at it from a boat. And luckily, um, hydroacoustic tools were developed and sort of became common to measure rivers in the 90s and are used in large rivers throughout, throughout the world now. So this is, these are our, um, this is our armada of survey boats. We have boats of various sizes. Our, Largest boat here has our multi-beam survey. This is a boat we take up to Montana, a jet boat, so it has a lower draft where um, we're working on a braided system on the Yellowstone River. And then our smallest boat is a little bigger than this table, and it's a remote controlled boat. So it's, it's a water drone, and we can put survey equipment on that and use it. It's actually pretty difficult to drive it around. You have to get really good at the controls, but um, it's a fun little toy. 
So on this large muddy river, um, there, there are some fish that have, have evolved with the river um, and are, have um, developed some life history strat strategies that, that have, um, so, so they're large river specialist fish and they thrive in the turbid, muddy conditions of the Missouri River. Pallid sturgeon are the, the main species we work with and I'm not a biologist, I just work with pallid sturgeon. I've worked with the US Geological Survey in my position for about 15 years. So I've had an office next to, to a pallid sturgeon biologist and I've worked with them for 15 years so I can, I can speak the talk but I don't, I'm, not, um, I'm not an expert in the biology, I bring the geomorphology to the table. But um, pallid sturgeon have a really interesting life history. This is an adult sturgeon here. They, um, they can get quite large. They migrate hundreds of miles upstream to spawn. They spawn over coarse, hard substrates. So on, um, on the current river, that are, and I'll talk about this in a while, the, the modern day river, they're spawning on revetments and some bedrock. Um, these eggs are adhesive and they, they stick to the coarse substrates. They incubate in the substrate for three to eight days. Then they have this phase where they emerge and these free embryos is what they are called, um, drift downstream. We're really still working in the laboratory. Um, their, their development rate changes with temperature, so it's variable, but it, it appears to be about nine to 16 days of, is the drift phase. Then they sort of settle or um, end up out of the drift into, into low to marginal river habitats. So these, these may be areas behind wing dikes that are, that are slower, that might have more food. And then they grow to sexual maturity, which can take upwards of seven to 14 years. So um, these fish live a long time. The fish, the, the population that lives above the sequence of dams in Montana, that's kind of sort of stranded um, downstream of Fort Peck Dam, is older than the dams. So these fish can be, the dams, Fort Peck went in in the, uh, the 30s. The, sequ the dams sort of went in from the 30s to the 60s. And uh, the population of fish that are behind the dams are quite old. Why do we care about moving sand? What a pallid sturgeon? What, 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 a, what does the bottom of the river have to do with pallid sturgeon? Well, again, when I was talking about spawning, Zones of bed stability are probably needed for successful incubation. So the idea is in these coarse substrates where the fish are spawning, if they get covered with a sand dune, that that could possibly smother the egg, which needs oxygen to survive. So we're trying to figure out where the sand is moving and where, it's, where um, areas that are stable. And this is a lot of what is true for the uh, pallid sturgeon is also true for shovel nose sturgeon and paddlefish, which are also um, fish that are native to the Missouri River, but not endangered. Now, um, pallids do hybridize with shovelnose sturgeon, um, so you do see a little bit of, a, of a, um, a connection between those two species, and then paddlefish are actually one of the, they're a really popular game fish that people like to fish um, on the Missouri and its tributaries. So sand dunes are also valuable um, foraging habitat. Um, areas that, that are stable, may produce invertebrates, but areas that are moving, so invertebrates are often part of the drift. So you have um, some component of macroinvertebrates and insects, which are food for fish, moving along with organic matter with the sand dunes. So fish may be using these, we have some evidence to suggest fish are using these sand dunes for foraging. And then down on the, the lower Missouri, especially in Missouri, um, these fish migrate hundreds of miles to spawning, and we have some data sets that, that indicate at very high flows that the, the engineered navigation channel may, may be energetically difficult for these fish to travel upstream. And the river's pretty different today than it was when these fish evolved, and the navigation channel and the high, high cores of velocities, you see these red areas of the high velocity zones, may provide some challenges for the fish. So that's sort of the motivation of why, why we're looking at the bottom of the river. There are also some, some other things that our research is, is helping with. Um, some of our methods improve bed load transport measurements, which is not what we do directly, but other people in the agency do that. And some of the tools we use are, are developing um, new methods for, for measuring bed load transport on sand bedded rivers, which is a challenging thing to do. Monitoring things like sand dredging and understanding shoaling. So shoaling is where sand deposits on the river, and which is often an impediment to um, barge navigation. So I'm gonna go through a series of tools for looking at the bottom. So the simplest we have are um, this bed material sampler. 
You drop it on the bottom, it brings up sand. We have a, an underwater microscope or our sand cam, which is the lower picture, and you drop that to the bottom and it takes a picture. So this is a microscope view, that, that's a one millimeter. So you can actually get a grain size distribution digitally from that image. You can take that and get a bu take a bunch of measurements and get a large grain size distribution. Um, so that helps us quantify the sizes of sand, but what's challenging are, if you can see these larger particles, we really want to know about gravels and larger particles, which are where the fish are, are spawning probably. And with one millimeter, the whole field of view is five millimeters. You're only seeing maybe a part of a larger rock. So the sand cam is useful, but not so useful in determining where fish spawn. Um, we've been using side scan sonar for a while. And what side scan sonar does is it gives you a, um, there's a, it's a side looking um, sound image and you can, you can see some details. So this, this line in the middle is where the boat drove and you have some, a blank area but this is out looking on the side. The blank area is the water column. But you see these are sand dunes here, and there are the dark places are acoustic shadows, so places that block the sound return. So we see some interesting things with side scan sonar. We can see large sand dunes. We can see this is rock revetment, some concrete blocks here in the river, and sometimes even vehicles. So this is right downstream of a boat, a boat ramp, and there was a vehicle. <laughs> we're, we're pretty sure it was a vehicle. Someone had a bad day. Um, we've used side scan sonar to look at spawning areas. You can sometimes see fish. So fish will ha be up in the water column, so they'll have a shadow. So some of these bright spots here are potentially fish. Um, we determine this to be gravel. Sometimes we'll sample or we'll send the sand cam down to verify what the substrate actually is. And then these are medium sand dunes. This is in one of our spawning sites. This is in a spawning spot on the Yellowstone River, and we determined that these are gravel patches within a mostly sandy bed, and that those may be where fish are spawning. Um, one instrument that we use, a dual frequency identification sonar. And can you guys see that? This is looking, this is using sound to look in the muddy water, and it's labeled here. So we're looking downstream, and you can see this is a dune, and these are pallid sturgeon spawning. This is the, during the time period they were spawning. There's some coarse substrate here. You can see some gravels. You can see, see this fuzzy stuff kind of moving? That's the sand moving. So these dunes are moving. There's, there's a heavy bed load. This is on the Yellowstone River at fairly high flow in, the, in June. So we have the, the Didson camera. One tool we use for measuring the water column is an acoustic Doppler current profiler. This is actually what the USGS uses nationwide and many people use all over the world to measure um, discharge. So if you know the velocity and the cross-sectional area, you can measure the amount of water going downstream. This is what it, our ADCP looks like. So here's a, a cross-section, velocity cross-section. We have sounding going to the bottom. There's an area on the bottom where the ADCP can't measure. This is, there's a little exaggeration on here, but can't measure down to here. You get a four-beam depth, and you get fairly detailed information in the water column. There's, there's a data point for every ensemble in the velocity, and we often will average this to a depth average velocity, of, um, unless we're showing it in a cross-section. Now positioning can always be tricky on a big river. We're, we're actually pretty lucky on the Missouri in that we can use GPS often. So we'll use different flavors of GPS, um, starting with differential, which has a little, um, that's pretty similar to, to the units inside your phone. We'll subscribe to an additional correctioning, or we'll, um, we'll go down to um, PPK, RTK, and uh, PPP, which are um, fairly high resolution surveyor, survey grade um, corrections will, um, the, in Missouri, we're really lucky the state of Missouri has a, MoDOT has a correction network that allows us to get centimeter, centimeter level precision um, anywhere we can get a cell phone signal. So it doesn't, not all of the river is, is within cell phone, but where we can get it, we use it. And these are the types of maps we've produced using um, this is the four beam depth map and this is a velocity map of the river. And these points here, are, this was a palisturgeon spawning area, I'll get to that in a little bit. So this is the, the cross section strategy when we make those maps is we'll drive back and forth across the river. It's pretty time consuming. 
We can get a depth map and a velocity map. But the next tool I'm going to talk about pretty soon is our multi-beam, which has allowed us, it's really been a game changer in our, our surveying. And it, it um, allows us to drive downstream and collect 512 beam, or pings at a time. So you're essentially painting the river as you go downstream. Well, in our single beam days, I just want to go over the really quickly. I'm going to show you here that um, since this is from 2000 to 2017, so 17 years, we have about 400 field days. That's a lot of field, field days. But we've, we've done some pretty cool stuff recently in um, taking all our data. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, but what we're learning, what we can do with this sort of the big data approach now is we can write code to analyze all our data to look at how the Missouri River is different in different places. So this is moving upstream. This is um, the Osage segment, so this is down towards St. Louis, moving upstream. The Kansas River segment is here, so this is Kansas to the Grand. And then moving upstream, and this is the Yellowstone in the upper Missouri up in Montana. And, and what you can see when, when really obvious thing, this is velocity, is that as, as we move downstream, so this is right below Gavin's Point Dam in South Dakota, as you move downstream you start to get more variety in velocity, so we get a bimodal velocity, and this is because the wing dikes are, are very large as you move downstream, and especially in the state of Missouri, so you get more slow places on the river. Um, you get a lot more shallow water habitats, you can see these shallower areas increase as you move downstream. And in those 400 field days, really quickly, instead of showing at the end, I'm going to give a shout out to, um, I did not collect all this alone. I collected a lot of them, but we've had a lot of people over the years collect data on the boats. So getting to the multi-beam, um, multi-beams were developed from marine, marine world. And again, it's a, it's a sound wave that forms into beams, 512 beams, and it essentially paints the, the bottom of the river. And we kind of, um, talk about how when you're driving multi-beam data, you're, it's like mowing the lawn. So we'll di drive downstream, turn around, drive upstream with a little bit of overlap, and sort of do that until we're the whole way across the river. And it's, it's a lot, um, it, it requires a lot of precision in, in terms of the surveying. We, we really need to have our either RTK or the, or the PPK um, GPS. But it, it provides a really high resolution data set. And if any of you are familiar with LIDAR on land surface, which is, is a very similar um, type of data in, in its data point density, and that's from, flown from planes, but it uses a lot of the same positioning tools that we use. So this is what the raw point data, this, each, this is sort of a, if you look at this wavy line, these are each different, different sweeps with the boat. And each of these, these individual pings are really tiny, but each of these is a, is a um, is a one of these waves? Some multi-beam data in action. So this is the data as it's coming in. This is revetment here. So this is rocky, the kind of rocky edge of the river. These are sand dunes. We're just slowly driving upstream. This is a lot of data. You're getting a lot of data really quickly, which is really nice compared to the days where we had to drive back and forth across the river all day. This is our multi-beam boat. Uh, we're currently collecting a different type of data, but this is the multi-beam. This is our old multi-beam. We just got a new one. It's been on the river once, but it's got, this is its, its uh, predecessor. The new one's really exciting. I'm hoping that uh, next time I come back, I'll have even better pictures. This is our positioning system. This is the RTK base station that we use sometimes that's talking to the boat. You can see the boat has multiple antennas. It's got a, um, an inertial motion unit, so it's got a, internal gyro compasses so we can monitor and record the pitch, heave, and roll of the boat to precisely correct all the positions. And this is the type of data we get. This is um, one of my favorite maps. This is collected if you've ever been to where the Big Money Speaker Series is in Rocheport at the, the winery at Rocheport. This is just below the bluff there. And this is a cross section just showing you for scale. These dunes are almost three meters high. So these are really high dunes um, and pretty long. This one is about 75 meters on average long. So these are the largest dunes. But what's really interesting is in this whole area, just the range of dune sizes. Until we had a multi-beam, we had no idea the river looked like this. We knew that there were dunes because we could do a single straight line pass, but we had no idea 
that there were dunes on top of dunes on top of dunes, and that you could, there's just dunes of all sorts of scales. So it's really kind of fascinating to look at these images. I'm going to have some of these in the show at the gallery in May, so you can walk up closer and look at them. Here's a, another site that we mapped down near Hartsburg, Missouri. And I'm going to go over some of the features we see with these. So we, the channel engineering, this is a very high flow. This, I mapped this during the 2011 flood on the Missouri, where we had high flow most of the summer. You can see things like spur dikes, L-head dikes, um, features of bank revetment, rootless dikes. So this is a, a place where the core has taken out a significant portion of dike in the name of um, trying some habitat restoration techniques. And you can see some of these dikes have been notched as well to, to um, attempt to, to do some habitat manipulation. Other river features and habitats, you'll hear people talk about the Thalweg or the main current. If you're a kayaker, it's where you want to stay. It's where the um, deepest part of the river is. Um, Dike-related scour holes are prominent features on the river. Um, and then these, these sandbars, which are, um, we think, prime nursery areas for small sturgeon, are these um, sinuosity or flow attachment sandbars. So probably a combination of the river, river um, bending here and this wing dike caused the flow to separate out and some of it to slow down. And what's really neat about this map is this is the first place we noticed these dunes, which are oriented sort of at a 45 degree angle from the main current. And that indicates that the flow is, is going this way. Dunes are generally oriented with the flow. So with these drifting sturgeon that I talked about during their drift phase, um, if they end up in the thawweg, they're just going to go downstream and they may end up in the Mississippi River before they're large enough to, uh, or th they may leave the Missouri system. But if they end up getting out of the flow and into these areas, these might, may be the types of areas that young sturgeon can grow. And there's a real bottleneck we, uh, with recruitment, and recruitment with sturgeon is um, growing into adults. So a sturgeon that is um, spawned in the river and then grows to reproductive age. And then um, dike, the smaller sandbars are these dike-related sandbars. So getting into the pallet sturgeon um, life history, with the multi-beam we've done quite a bit of work with um, sturgeon spawning. And um, from 2007 to 2013, we documented 22 sturgeon spawning events. This was done with um, my colleagues who actually put tags in fish and the acoustic tags and fish, and they've tracked the fish. We have um, colleagues in, in Nebraska from Nebraska Game of Parks who have helped as well. And they've intensively tracked the fish during their spawning period, and they've locate, they'll go hundreds of miles upstream, and we've mapped habitat at 10 of these sites, and then done repeat work in other years to look at the dynamics of these sites and how they change over time. And one thing I do want to point out on this, about pallet surgeon spawning is, um, that they're spawning all over the river. We're, we're, we've documented spawning all the way almost to Gavin's Point Dam. There's two sites in Kansas City, in the city, that we mapped in 2008, and quite a few down here. Um, that doesn't mean they don't spawn other places, but the fish that we tagged spawned in these locations. But we, before pallet surgeon spawning was documented on the river, we didn't know if there was one spawning ground on the entire river for the fish, or if um, there were multiple sites. And we don't know if this is a good thing, a natural thing, or a bad thing. So this may be a case, on the Yellowstone River, we see fewer spawning sites and we see larger numbers of fish coming together. Um, this may be a, a case where they're spawning primarily on bank revetment. We built a lot, of, we put a lot of bank revetment on the river when the river was channelized. So we may have created more spawning habitat and the fish are not able to find each other is one of the hypotheses about the spawning. So this is what the spawning sites look like. The ones in, this one's in Kansas City here. And this is the downtown airport, I think, here. So these two sites are in Kansas City. And this, these points here are where we think the fish was spawning. Now, we don't have, we don't have um, tags in the oviduct yet. We don't know exactly where the eggs were laid. But we do know that during the time the fish was spawning, so they tracked the fish intensively, and then they caught her after the behavior. There's sort of a behavioral period where she'll sp swim up, up and downstream along the revetment. And occasionally they, they had a tracked male with her or they would see on the Didson sonar that I showed you male or other fish in the, in, in the area. So these are the points where we hypothesize spawning may have occurred and they're all right along the bank. This is, this is on bedrock here, so this is all coarse, 
course substrate on the bed, but they're generally right along the bank revetment on the course substrate. This is what the velocity looks like. They're spawning in um, very fast places. It's, they're very rarely are they in the, the slower waters. So they're in the thalweg right along the revetment. We can um, look at the specific ranges of depth and velocity that they're using versus what there is on the whole river. I won't go into a huge amount of detail with that. Um, but here's a 3D visualization of the, what spawning areas look like. You can see these are actually fish locations and that they're spawning sort of, we think somewhere probably in these interstitial areas at the, at the bottom of the revetment where it's, it's kind of flat. But we have, we have yet to actually catch. So they like to put egg mats down in, in to um, determine if fish are where fish are spawning. So they're um, sort of like a furnace filter, textured mat. And they'll put that in a spawning area, and if you get eggs in the mat, then you know for sure the fish spawn there. Problem on the Missouri is egg mats are really, it's difficult to put anything on the bottom and get it back, <laughs> and they tend to fill with sand. So we have, we have yet to, to successfully retrieve eggs off the bottom, but we have a pretty good idea that they're spawning at the, at the base of the revetment. Here's again what these spawning areas look like with the multi-beam. This is the revetment. These, you can see it's a really narrow strip between the sand dunes and the revetment, the base of the revetment. And this is a bedrock site. So this site has these mounds with a pretty good amount of relief, maybe as big as this table of um, sort of gravelly material on the local dolomite. Um, down in the, this is what the rock looks like here, down in sort of the central part of Missouri. And this is what... Bank revetment looks like this is near Atchison, Kansas. This is down um, near Miami, Missouri. And you have a lot of it in Kansas City as well. These eggs are really tiny. They're three millimeters across. So that's sort of our goal is to someday find an egg that, is, that has come from a spawning search or a fertilized egg in the river. But uh, it's a difficult thing to do. We do sample for larvae after that incubation period is over and we have caught larvae that have spawned in the Missouri in the Missouri, but we haven't um, found that perfect sturgeon with the same genetics as the, the parent that spawned on the lower river yet. We have on the Yellowstone River. So we've done some work to look at the dynamics. This is the same site um, near the, where the Lamine River comes in, the same spawning location at different flows. So you see bigger dunes on some days than others. And then what, what I've done with the boat is map um, multiple times on the same day. So what you can do is you can, you can overlay those maps and look at movement. So where you're seeing the red here is where there was erosion and blue is where there's deposition. So these dunes are moving. The gray areas is where there wasn't really much net movement. So it's a good thing. Here's a cross-section example of these two overlaying maps. You can see the dunes. We could have deposition and erosion. And the good news for the sturgeon is we believe they are spawning on the lower river in relatively stable places where there isn't a lot of dune movement because they're spawning right along the revetment here where there isn't a lot of movement. If you move out towards the fallweg, there's a lot of dune movement. Well, on the Yellowstone River, as I said before, we have um, the population sort of trapped between the dams. And they've shown quite a bit of site fidelity. Um, we've been working since about 2011 um, doing telemetry and habitat measurements. And most years they've spawned in this, I think it's about six kilometer area in different patches. It's not usually in the same location. A couple times it's been near, near each other, but they sort of, they have an affinity for this place right on the North Dakota border. There've been a few outlier years where we probably had spawning on the upper Missouri in 2011 and one fish went up near the Powder River and potentially spawned in the Powder or the Yellowstone um, above intake dam, which is a whole other story for another night. <laughs> um, but this site I'm going to talk about here is, is called the Fairview Reach on the North Dakota border. And we've mapped over the years, we've mapped this Fairview Reach. We had our multi beam out there in 2015 and mapped these spawning patches. This is what spawning on the Yellowstone River looks like. So we have the gray points are males. So multiple males that are tagged in the population. The, red, the yellow point here is female radio code. Her code was 41. So code 41, this is over a 12-hour period, really moved around quite a bit. The um, multiple males, so there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 males here. And they, um, they were also moving as well. Um, 
and over a, sort of a 12 or they, they stayed out I think they, they got there at 9 and they stayed out till maybe 11 p.m. and they caught her the next day and she had no eggs so they're, they have a pretty good idea that she spawned here but what's really interesting here is what do these look like anyone sand so the, the, these look like sand dunes so this really surprised us um, and caused us to scratch our heads a bit because sturgeon are supposed to spawn on rock and this is the the, the population that is um, not the the channel morphology on the Yellowstone and the upper Missouri although it's we're between dams and the system is not completely um, natural the Yellowstone has a channel morphology that is is quite quite like it's always been it's not it's not that altered it's got large sandbars and um, moving islands and a natural flood hydrograph there there isn't a lot of um, it's, it's one of the wilder rivers in North America so we were pretty surprised by this and we'll be doing more years of research to figure out why they're spawning on sand we do think um, that we did a lot of sampling that there are some small patches of gravel within these dunes but if they they're very small they don't show up on the multi-beam so here's a cross section and these sand dunes are moving. They're not moving as quickly as they are in the lower river, but um, they are moving. We've got um, one point, so about a, a four hour period and, and uh, the dunes are translating downstream. So dunes are moving about 1.29 meters per hour in this area and I'll show you some, some cross sections on the lower Missouri where they're moving quite faster. Um, so that's what one spawning site, we have many on the Yellowstone, but that's what one looked like. This is what we had another, potentially we didn't have great telemetry on this fish because she kind of snuck up and spawned when we, weren't, when we were busy at the other site. Um, but this area was really interesting. The, this is raw multi-beam data, so this isn't edited heavily and it's not made into a gridded map, but I, I really like this tree here. And then this, this is a, a bedrock, there's a bluff here and this is a bedrock mound. We think the fish may have spawned sort of in this area. We don't, we don't have great telemetry on this one, but they did get genetics off of this site. So this site, they had a female spawn and they had two genetically palace, genetic palastrogen larvae from two different males. So we do know that multiple males are participating in spawning and that the female did spawn. So they caught the larvae a few days or after the incubation period. So one interesting thing about the Yellowstone River, which I said has natural channel geomorphology, is it does have this fairly large flood every, every June, and it changes. So you know, I showed you that those ovals were all over the place in that, in that six kilometer reach. Well, we mapped it in 2014 and 15. We mapped it in in 16, I don't have that up today. But this sandbar eroded. You can see some of these, the thawweg here moved over. That, this got a lot deeper. So the red areas are erosion and the blue areas are deposition. So you can see almost every, there was almost nowhere on the river that was exactly the same as it was the year before. Yet, if you look at the, the erosion and deposition numbers, it was almost exactly the same amount of sediment eroded as was, as was deposited. So they call that equilibrium in a river. So about the same amount of sand is coming in and leaving the reach, but it's, it's rearranging itself. And that's what rivers do. <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's kind of fun to work on the Yellowstone. I, I've spent most of my career on the lower Missouri where it's a navigation channel. And it is fun to work on a, a river that has sandbars that move up in Montana. Here's another image of the Yellowstone River. This is a gravelly spot. So this is where we thought they'd be spawning. This is just upstream from the sandy spot I showed you. Um, these are sand dunes on a gravel bed. So we did quite a bit of sampling to verify that, but these, are, these dunes are sand and this flat area here in between the dunes is gravel. This is that, that bedrock area that I showed you, that tree is about here and this is the bedrock mount. And here's a cross section of these sand dunes on the gravel bed and then there's the point cloud. I thought this was a pretty cool image of those sand dunes on top of the gravel bed. That's where we expected them to spawn and maybe, maybe this is where they'll spawn next year, who knows. And then I'm going to finish up with um, a story about the lower river and look at how do dunes in the same location. So I went out to the same place multiple times over a couple of years. 
I'm going to show you one year of the data to see how the dunes and that, how the river changes with discharge there. So look at how fast the dunes are migrating, what we can learn about temporal and seasonal patterns in sand transport, what the relationships are between spawning habitat and sand dune dynamics. So this is not a spawning site, but it has quite a bit of bank revetment and actually a large expansive bedrock. It's also really close to a boat ramp so I can get there from the office quickly, survey an entire day and get home. Um, and then the, kind of gets at the question about stable substrates um, over time scales relevant for embryo incubation and that we're measuring all day long um, sort of in the spring when eggs would be there. So here's an example of what, it, what the site looks like at low flow and high flow. The imagery is the same, but this is at a, a much lower flow, a much higher flow. We can, we can get the whole way across the channel at high flow. This is exposed sandbar at low flow here. And we measured over the course of the hydrograph. So we got a bunch of points in April, a few points in May. We got a high flow event. We went, went up to Montana and we're chasing sturgeon on the Yellowstone and then we got a point in late summer um, when we, after we got back. So we don't have a perfect data set here. I, what I really want to do is, is catch an entire peak and get it as it's going up at the top and as it's going down. But we have quite a bit of, of surveys here. This is what this site looked like at high flow. What I want to point out here, this is a tree. There are quite a few trees in here. You can see the trees. This is bedrock. So here's sort of the line between the bedrock and the dunes. And this is, um, these are like large blocky boulders. So there's a bluff here and the railroad. And they did a lot of, uh, of dynamiting, I think, to, and, uh, to build the railroads. So that some of these blocky boulders might, might have fallen in the river from that. Or they could be natural. But there's definitely a bluff here. And this is bedrock. And this is the site on uh, July 15th. So this is one map. This is four maps animated about an hour between passes. And you can see the dunes migrating. So we have dunes migrating over a daily, daily scale rather quickly. I'm going to point out here this is not from this site. This is from a different site. But it's a different river at different discharges. So this is a low flow, this is a medium, this is a very high flow. Notice how the velocity increases quite a bit. Well, as the velocity increases, your dunes are going to increase in size and your sand moves faster. So this is an animation of all the surveys I showed you along the hydrograph. And what I want to point out here is watch this scour. So we start, we start in April. Got a bunch of surveys in April and May. And then in, in mid-May, with that first high event of the year, we scoured out all this sand. You can, you can kind of see this, this boulders in the same place. This, this was really interesting for us because this is a place we can see the bottom. We know where the bottom is. So we can see the volume of sand. That's, we don't know where the bottom is over here, but down here, we see the volume of sand scouring out. That large rock is about two and a half meters, this one here, in diameter. So I'll show you a cross section from here. Oops. So here it is. Um, there's a person for scale. Um, this is that, so that May 21st event, the bed dropped this much. This is five meters scale here. So we eroded about two meters of sediment there. We learn something new every time we go out. So this was, this was kind of exciting. This is a long profile. So this is, this is a cross section through the middle of the reach. And the dunes are much larger at higher flow. And this is showing the lowest flow and the highest flow. We've got meter, dunes moving at about 1.7 meters per hour at the lowest flow and about 3.5 meters per hour at that high flow. That's a fast moving dune. That dune is really moving quickly. I took the, the first survey of the year. So this is the hydrograph again. I took the first survey of the year and the last survey of the year and looked at the volume comparison. And red is erosion, blue is deposition. Do you see any deposition? <laughs> There's a tiny bit here. So we had almost all erosion. So you can't see these percentiles right here, but it was, you know, the Yellowstone I showed you, it was, it was a red and blue mixed, and it was about even. 
This is a 50% deficit, and the, the net to total volume ratio was 99. That was, it was just almost every, almost every pixel on the map had erosion, and in some places, very large amount of erosion. And the, the really interesting thing, I don't have the data up right now, but in 2016, we did the same thing, and we saw the same trend. So we think, at least at this site, that um, over the, the winter, during the um, sort of the lower flow season, the sand accumulates on the bed, and then when you get sort of the first big rise of the year, it moves a lot of sediment. So each, different floods move, you have different conditions seasonally with different types of floods. And that as the flow, this is, this is sort of the rise to the nav season and the natural flood on the Missouri. And that potentially that, that flood moves more sediment than uh, any of the other floods in the spring. So the largest volume of erosion occurred during the first high flow of the season. Before that, during the first five surveys, the, um, the, the balance between deposition and erosion was almost even. So. In summary, wrapping up, um, the Missouri River is a river of sand. I did show you a few places that were bedrock and a few places that had revetment, but in general, it's a sand-bedded, sandy river. There's some, some finer sediments um, in between wing dikes and in, in some of the slower areas, but it's primarily a sand-bedded river. Sand dunes are moving downstream at all discharges. So even when you're out there in the winter at the lowest flows, those dunes are still moving. They're moving faster at higher flows, but they're moving. We've never gone out there and not found dune movement. There's a lot of variation um, in bed form size, how fast and where sand is moving. And this one place I showed you had a lot of erosion, but there may be other, you know, that, that is sort of a, um, a straight reach. There may be places and bends that have very different trends. So it's, I always find that the more I work on the river, the more data I collect, I always just want more. So uh, we are going to start um, working in repeat measurements in, in some different channel settings to see what we get. Um, measuring where and how fast the bed is moving helps us understand the dynamics of habitats in the river for pallid sturgeon and, I put an asterisk there, for other fish. So a lot of the things we've learned in our pallid sturgeon research projects apply to other fish like paddlefish or um, even our Asian carp folks can, um, can learn some of the things we've learned about the river to try and get rid of carp in the Missouri. Um, but the, uh, the pallets primarily, we're, we're learning things about spawning, foraging, growth, and how fish move and migrate in the river. And if you'd like to know more, our pallet surgeon project has a blog. Got the address up here. If you just Google pallet surgeon blog, it comes up. And our website has links to all our publications. So you can always email me if you have any questions. I do have a few copies. So that last bit I showed about dune movement, I have um, a few copies with me of the of a recent pub publication that has some of those maps and, and a lot of the numbers. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you.